We've completed our first seven steps, knowing full well we're going to be working on six and seven for the rest of our lives, really, trying to change as the opportunity comes up. Now, we've read in the book where we are spiritually sick, mentally sick, and physically sick. And it says when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. And we begin to look at those things and begin to realize that all human beings really are born to live in three dimensions of life. You know, if God dwells in each of us, we're going to have to live with God whether we like it or not is beside the point. The only question is, do we live with Him in harmony or disharmony? I don't know of anybody that ever got in more disharmony with God than we alcoholics have. We also have what we call the mental dimension. We've all got a mind. Sometimes we act like we don't, but we do. And we have to live with our mind, whether we like it or not. It's beside the point. We don't have any choice. And again, do we live there in harmony or disharmony? I don't know of any group of people that ever got more fouled up in their heads than we alcoholics have. For years, I thought the physical dimension was my body only. Today I realize the physical dimension is the world and everything in it, period. Now, we alcoholics don't have any place else to live except here on earth. We don't have any choice in the matter whether we like it or not is beside the point. The only question is, do we live on earth with our fellow man in harmony or disharmony? And I don't know of any group of people that ever got more fouled up in our relationship with the world and everybody in it than we alcoholics have. So we were sick spiritually, mentally, and physically. The book talks about a design for living. And it looks to us like these steps are designed in such a manner to put us back together and make us well in all three dimensions of life as God intended for us to be in the first place. Step one, two, and three, we got right with the Spirit. Because we were powerless... We saw the need for the power. Step three, we decided to go after that power. And we made a decision that God was going to be the director. That He's the Father, we're the children, He's the employer, we're the employee. For most of us, that's the first time we've had that relationship with God for a long, long, long time. We got the right relationship in one, two, and three. That removed just enough self-will to let us begin to look into our own minds. And in step four and five, we found out those things that block us off from God, that block us off from our fellow man, that creates the resentments and the fears and the guilts and etc. And we begin to work on those in step six and seven. We begin to get right in our minds through four, five, six, and seven. Now, that removes just enough self-will to begin to look at our relationship with the world and everybody in it. Now, through 4, 5, 6, and 7, we got rid of these resentments up here. We got rid of these fears up here to the level God intended for them to be. But we really haven't done anything about the storeroom back here that's filled with guilt and remorse associated with the harms we've done in the past. And if we want to get right in the physical dimension, our relationship with the world and everybody in it, it's long been known that the way you do that is to make restitution for the things done in the past. Then the guilt and the remorse begins to disappear. Now, I've never yet seen a newcomer come into a meeting and read the steps off the wall and say that I can hardly wait till we get to steps 8 and 9. That looks like a lot of fun. (laughs) Nobody likes to do steps 8 and 9. Nobody that I've ever met. Some people might, but not that I know. The only question is, can we afford not to do that? It looks like if we don't do that, that guilt and remorse in here just kind of keeps chewing at us. And after a while, it begins to bother our relationship with the world and everybody in it. We start getting sick in our head. 
And after a while, that backs up and blocks us off from God, and we end up drunk again. You know, when we read the foreword to the second edition, it sounded as though Dr. Bob never took another drink after Bill visited with him the first time. That isn't true. Dr. Bob had one more drunk left in him. Not too long after Bill called on him, and they began to try to work with people, Bob found it necessary to go to a medical convention, and his wife Ann begged Bill not to let him go. He said, Bill, if he goes over there, he'll get drunk. He does it every year. And Bill said, let him go. He's got to learn to live in society where there's always going to be plenty of alcohol. Bob went to the medical convention, got drunk, came back to Akron, showed up at his nurse's home. She called Ann and said, come and get him. He's drunk. And said, get him sobered up. He's got surgery in the morning. And he's the only doctor on staff right now that can do this particular surgery. Dr. Bob was a proctologist. Whatever your procto is, I'm glad he wasn't working on mine the next morning. I know that. <laughs> they went over and got him and brought him back to Dr. Bob's house, and they coffeeed him, and they walked him, and they sobered him to the best of their ability. The next morning, Bill took him to the hospital to do the surgery. In the parking lot at the hospital, Dr. Bob said, Bill, I can't do this surgery. He said, I'm sick, and I'm shaking, and I'm trembling, and I'm going to hurt somebody bad. Bill reached in the back seat of the car, got out a bottle of beer, popped the top on it, said, drink this and you'll be okay. Dr. Bob drank the beer, went upstairs, did the surgery, and sure enough, it came out okay. Now, the only problem is he disappears. Bill's waiting on him down in the parking lot. He waits two or three, four hours. He assumes that the beer's triggered the allergy and Bob's off and running. He goes back to Dr. Bob's house. Bill and Ann wait all afternoon. Late, late, late evening, Dr. Bob shows up and he's sober. Bill said, where in the hell have you been? He said, I've been going up and down both sides of the street, making my amends to those I've harmed in the past. That bottle of beer was the last drink Dr. Bob took, January the 10th, 1935, which is A.A.'s birthday. He never would make amends before because he was afraid people would find out he was alcoholic and he would lose what little practice he had left. He didn't know that everybody already knew he was alcoholic. <laughs> the day he scur screwed up the courage, mustered up enough courage to make his amends, was the day he took his last drink. Now, I would assume if it's good enough for Bob, it's probably good enough for me too. Let's look at 8 and 9 for just a few minutes. We're not going to go through them in great detail, just a few minutes. He said, now we need more action without which we find that faith without works is dead. Let's look at steps 8 and 9. You know, generally, if you go to a step study meeting and they begin to talk about step 8, generally the conversation will get over to whether how they made amends in step 9. But step 8 is a definite step, and it's a step that needs to be done. He said, Let's, we have a list of all persons we had harmed and to whom we were willing to make amends. He said, we made it when we took inventory. We would simply take all those names off of column one, off of those four sheets, and any one that we've harmed, we put them on one long sheet. Haven't made any amends yet. We just made the list. And then the book says, we subjected ourselves to a drastic self-appraisal. Well, we did that in steps four and five, a drastic self-appraisal. He said, now we're about to go out to these fellows and repair the damage done in the past. We attempt to sweep away the debris which has accumulated out of our effort to live on self-will and run the show ourselves. If we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. More prayer in step eight. And again, it's real simple. We make the list. Then we become willing to the list. And if we're not willing, we ask God to help us to become willing. We haven't made any amends yet. That's step eight. And when we do that, then we've completed step eight.